I'm Marie Denoya Aronson here with Judy Shaw, who served as Governor Christy Todd Whitman's Chief of Staff. Judy Shaw was New Jersey's first female Chief of Staff to a governor, and she joins us today as part of an ongoing series of interviews about Governor Whitman's administration for the Center on the American Governor at Rutgers University's Eagleton Institute of Politics. Judy, to begin with, tell us about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? I grew up in New Jersey. I, I'm a Jersey girl who doesn't pump gas, which has been difficult living in Massachusetts because I have to. Um, but I went to school in Pennsylvania. I went to uh, Penn State, had a double major in Spanish. Uh, thought I would teach, which I did. I taught elementary and secondary school when I came out. Um, and then I was married, and that's kind of where I started the political life. I, I did that for a number of years. And um, then I went back to school. I went to uh, Rutgers for a master's in public policy, kind of in the, um, the middle of Tom Kane's two appointments. And I stayed here until I retired four years ago. So I really think I am a Jersey girl, and my roots are in Jersey politics. Talk to me about the politics that you began to become interested in when you, you mentioned when you were married. That's when this started to become a path for you. Tell us about that. About two weeks after I was married, the party, and at that time there was only one party in Ocean County, the Republican Party, uh, came to my new husband and said, we really want you to run for the assembly. So that was a pretty quick introduction to uh, life in, uh, in the political world. So I ran his campaign for the assembly successfully. And then I worked as a legislative aide for him for the two years. And he was seeking re-election during the Watergate-Nixon time frame. And all of the Republicans in Ocean County were turned out. I mean, it was amazing that the coattails could go from the President of the United States down to a little local race in Ocean County, New Jersey, but it did. So they were turned out of office. The Democrats came in. And I spent the next number of years working to raise money and in party development, recruiting candidates, you know, trying to stay as viable as we could and, until it was our turn again. So clearly that experience didn't discourage you? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, I think it emboldened you because you, you really want to win back that position. We felt that we had left work on the table that was undone, um, and we wanted to get back to it. And, and we wanted our candidates to be in, in Trenton, not the other party. Any issues that you can think of uh, off the top of your head that you felt were undone at that point that were, really motivated you to keep, keep at it? There were lots of concerns about taxation. Um, that's when that was first coming to play uh, as a result of a Supreme Court decision for education and how to fund education. Um, one of my favorite political stories is that the candidates were working so hard to learn the ins and outs of this very elaborate taxing plan, because at the time we didn't have an income tax. So everybody had his, I wish I could say, or her uh, interpretation, but they were very schooled in it. And we were at some little meeting and they were explaining what they would do that would be so much better than the Democratic plan. And they said, well, and now we'll take questions. The little guy gets up in the back of the room. And he said, um, I just want to know if the leaf sucker is still going to come to my street. So to the point of all politics being local, a tax plan or not a tax plan, he wanted to know in the fall if his leaves were going to be picked up by the town. So that, that was a good uh, reminder then. But that... Taxation was the central part of those campaigns for that almost 10-year period. Tell us about your role in the Kane administration. Um, I started um, as the marketing director in the uh, New Jersey Lottery. Hazel Gluck, uh, in whose office I had worked when the Republicans did come back into office in Ocean County, 
Hazel was uh, first reelected, and I served in constituent services in her office. Uh, I ran her Senate campaign, losing campaign, but everyone else on the ticket won, including Tom Kane. And um, Hazel was made the director of the lottery, and she asked me to come in and be the marketing director. So that's really where I started. And during that period of time, I decided, I really felt that I needed more of a credential than just having, you know, worked as a legislative aide or um, just having worked with my husband when he was running. So I, I went back to school. I went to Rutgers and got a master's in public policy. And um, then I took a leave of absence from government and I worked in Tom Kane's reelect which was really a fascinating experience because we didn't have to run much of a campaign. He had governed so well in those first three years. By the time that we got to the fourth year, it was just out thanking people who had been supportive, uh, meeting people who were thanking him for what he had done, and shoring up the, the base and turning out the vote. Uh, very, very interesting to see a statewide campaign after seeing an assembly, a Senate, and now doing that. And then I was asked to go to the Department of Transportation as the chief of staff. Hazel was moved over from then the Department of Insurance to DOT, so I had an opportunity to work with her again, um, which I thought was the good news. The bad news was, and for her too, I think, the governor came to her and said, look, we really need to raise the gas tax to refund the transportation trust fund. That hadn't been done. The first time they put it in place, John Sheridan, Jim Weinstein as his chief of staff, had found a way to fund it without raising the gas tax. But when it was running on E, that seemed to be the only option. So it took us 18 months to raise the tax, I think, five cents. But that was a great experience because I, I became convinced that if you show people what they get for their money, they're willing to spend it. So while we all complained about the, the orange cones on every street and every bridge in New Jersey, people at least said, well, those are my tax dollars and I'm getting something for it. How so, did, How did you convey that? How did you build your case for that? Well, we, we had several very poignant arguments, we thought, of course. Um, but one thing we did from the political standpoint is that we made a list of every project in every legislative district. And we went to the legislators and said, if you can pass this, this is what you will get in your district. This bridge, this traffic light, this widening, this culvert, whatever the issue had been in, in that district. And then we made arguments on the, the broader scale, which talked about so many out-of-state people paying the tax, with New Jersey being a corridor state, you know, kind of between Philadelphia and New York. And we had the percentage. I don't recall now what it was, but to pick a number, 40% of all gas purchased in, in New Jersey is by out-of-staters. So we, we had 40% of that work being done by people out of state who weren't taxed for it. Um, and we had the lowest taxes of anybody in the country at the time. We went to labor and talked to them about all of the work that they would get um, and other good government arguments about the value of sound infrastructure, how long it would last. Um, and after 18 months, we were successful. And it's, it's the last time it was raised, by the way. It seems from the, uh, your formative years, if you will, in politics, that you had a lot of experience with campaign and honing your skills in, in really uh, convincing people. Did you have a natural uh, acumen for this when you first started with your husband? Um, I, I think so, probably. I, you know, silly little things. I had been the class president for three years in high school. I was the president of the Association of Women Students at Penn State. Um, I just always seemed to be the mouth, you know. I, I, was, I was the convincer. 
And people would come to me and say, you go make the argument, even if it was at home. You know, you talk to mom or you talk to the teacher or you talk to the neighborhood or something. Um, which probably, if we had had any money and if I had had good direction, I probably would have ended up going to law school, but I didn't. So I ended up really on the public policy side of things. And, and, and I like it. I see it as a sport and a challenge, and I love to make the system better and see how you can work it, try to help both sides get as much as they can get. I, I don't like the zero-sum game. I don't like leaving people bleeding on the floor. That's much more the skill set of partisan politics. I, I never enjoyed that part, but I do, I do like the persuasive side, um, and, and I do like the policy side. When did you first become involved? Well, let me ask you this. When did you first start to notice Christy Todd Whitman and think about her potential? I think she was first on my radar screen. I, I knew her just very little when Tom Kane appointed her to the Board of Public Utilities. And um, as most women were doing who were very active in this and a group of us who would gather at Eagleton, noting the number of female cabinet officers. It was nice to see another woman added to the cabinet. These were in the early days where we were going from none to some. Um, so I knew of her then. Um, actually, my stepdaughter went to work for her there uh, while she was going to law school in Newark. And I, I got to know her a little bit through my stepdaughter. And then um, when she ran against Bill Bradley, I would go hear her, and there would be sometimes two people in a flea uh, at these events, but I felt women had to support a woman running. And I loved her approach to the race because everyone said, well, Bill Bradley's such an icon. And she said, but every race deserves a challenge. And I'm gonna put that challenge forward. And they did it in a way that was very statesperson-like, uh, which I enjoyed too. Bill was gracious to her and she to him. Uh, they had very substantive arguments on uh, policy, uh, and the outcome was what the outcome was. But I, I loved the way that campaign was, was waged. When I spoke to Governor Whitman, she talked about how she presented the question about uh, Governor Florio's tax in increases in New Jersey and, and, and noted that, of course, as a U.S. Senator, he had nothing to do with them, but he really stumbled yes. because he never responded, basically, to her, her question that she kept putting to him. Did you note that? Were you paying attention to that part of the campaign and, and kind of seeing that unravel on Senator Bradley? Yes. And it was clear that it resonated with people. What he said was accurate as, as a federal uh, member of Congress, as, as a, state, a, state, a U.S. senator. He really didn't have any role in that. But to have that position in the party and not be aware of its impact on the state that he was responsible to represent it was a myth, uh, mismatch with people. I think people expected that he would have an opinion about that, and he didn't. He chose to say, it's not me, it's not mine, I don't own it. Um, and, and that really did have an impact, and, and Christie stayed with that, that message uh, and ventured forth her opinion of it. And some people liked her opinion and some didn't, but they would say, but she has an opinion. Um, so that's interesting that that was uh, noted during that race. I, I do, that was a pretty pivotal point, I think. Do you remember that election night? Do you remember your reaction to the rather extraordinary results? Of the Bradley race? Yes, how, how close Christy Whitman came in that race. I, I, I don't remember it. Clearly, I, I don't know if I was there. I, maybe I was there more in the general crowd, but certainly not on any in crowd and not on the inside where I could see what was going on, those dynamics. Um, 
I don't think anybody thought she was going to win. It never, it never got to a point where people thought she was going to, but they thought she had comported herself so well, um, like Wall Street, you know, beating expectations is big, even if you don't win. Uh, and I think she had beat expectations. Uh, and it certainly teed her up to think about running for governor because we have so few statewide races in New Jersey, unlike other states where sometimes the attorney general runs for office and, and the treasurer and, and other cabinet officers here, we've got the governor and the two U.S. senators. They're the only statewide races. So she had that mechanism in place from the Bill Bradley race. The question was, was she going to redirect and run for governor? Were you at all part of that conversation, or do you remember hearing that conversation as to whether or not she would run? Were you hoping she would? I was hoping that she would. Um, I wasn't deeply involved in those conversations. Um, at that point, I was working in Public Policy Advisors, a firm that Hazel had started, Governmental Relations and Lobbying. and. Um, she had spoken with Christie about running for office. Hazel had toyed with running, um, took a poll to see what her viability might be, and went to Christie and said, look, if you're going to run, I am going to step back and support you. I want to do something major in the campaign because I think, I think you've earned that coming off of the Bill Bradley race. If you're not, I really am going to take a shot at it. And she didn't want two women running against each other in the primary. I think women are over that now, by the way. But at the time, it was a gracious statement. So we had a very, very small firm. So the idea was I was supposed to keep the firm afloat while Hazel spent a lot of time with Christie. But when you're a small organization, you can't help but get drawn in. So once that decision was made, and I was way outside of that decision. I just started to get more and more involved as, as Hazel was more involved. Do you recall the point of entry for you into that campaign or some of the, uh, the roles you played in that campaign? I went to a lot of the events, and I was very interested to see her make this transition from the Senate race to the gubernatorial race um, subject matter somewhat different, issues different, constituencies played differently at, at that level. But, but I think I, I was in the office one day and I, Hazel and um, Christy were talking about something. There may have been other people there too. And something came up about a speech that she had to give. And I said, well, I'll take a crack at it. And I think that's where I really not thinking about it, but I think that's how my foot got in the door, or my nose under the tent, or whatever the analogy is. Um, I wrote a speech, and then I started doing research, and I started doing more speeches, and I started going to more meetings uh, around strategy and so forth. But I, I was far from an A player. I, I, Hazel was playing the major role, and my job was to keep the firm afloat. <laughs> do, you, do you recall observing how tough a campaign that was? When I spoke with uh, Governor Whitman, she talked about how she was depicted as this oozy, <laughs> oozy Tony drunk driver. I mean, in terms right. of, I know that um, the Whitman campaign was up against Governor Florio's, had Paul Begala, and James Carville. It was, it was, had the top guns. Big players. <laughs> yes, the A players, top guns. Um, it, it was very difficult, and, and it was difficult on another level as well, and that was the, the gender uh, differentiation. They really treated a female candidate differently. I think that ad that they ran about her being soft on guns and a drunken driver, and there was some third terrible element in that. I don't know that they would have run that against a male candidate. They, they would go after some of these character traits and was she a good mother and was she a good husband and 
was she soft on crime and things that I would pick up and, and you would pick up, no doubt, with the, some of the code words that said she's a female and she's not up to the job, right? She, she's, not, she's not tough enough. As, as she put it in, in our interview, she said she was depicted as the rich bitch from the hills. From the hills. Uh, yes. And that's absolutely true. And I used to laugh about it because um, this is in the early 80s, right? And you would go to her house. She had no air conditioning in the house. Uh, they didn't have cable TV. They were like your local farmers, if you will, in a lovely but older um, farm uh, house. She knew how to neuter uh, sheep. Uh, she knew how to bale hay. I mean, it was amazing the things that she did that were so contrary to the rich bee from, from the hills. And even after she was elected, I mean, we would, we would be in the city of Newark for an event, and she would make the troopers pull over because she wanted to run into pay less shoes because she needed a pair of boots because it was snowing. I mean, she would still be shopping at the, the lowest level. It was very funny that she had that image. There was no doubt that she came from a family uh, that had money, um, but she never flaunted that. She never wore it that way. Um, but I understand why the other side, uh, Governor Florio, had been from Camden, lived in an apartment uh, the whole time he served. They tried to make that contrast. I mean, you see it so much in the presidential campaign today about it's almost class warfare, if you will, at, at, at the Jersey level. Um, that victory, do you recall that night? It was actually November 1993. Do you recall that night? Because it was somewhat unexpected. I do. Tell us I about do. that. Um, the governor had a uh, dinner beforehand, a very small dinner. And uh, John Whitman's parents were there. And, and I hope I'll get this right. But one of the nicest toasts that I heard, John's mother said, I've been the daughter-in-law of a governor, and I am now about to become the mother-in-law of a governor. It was very, very nice because John's father, grandfather, had served as governor in the state of New York. Um, we were optimistic. We knew that we were trending up. I still think if you had gone around the room and taken a secret ballot, most people thought we didn't have it. But we were really pleased with the campaign and how it had been run. Um, and we were anxious, as most candidates are, for it to be over. It's grueling. It, it is absolutely grueling. I, I have so much respect for candidates at any level. I, I don't think the general public has a clue of what that takes and what they give up uh, to do that. So we were just, we had made the race, it was out of our hands, um, and that was it. And then we had, um, we had a series of rooms in the hotel in, in uh, Princeton, and there was a war room where people were counting votes, and we've got it, we don't, and oh my gosh, I thought that district was gonna go for us, and they didn't, and where the hell are the numbers for Passaic County, and. Uh, you know, you're really just trying to cobble together as much information as you can get. Um, lots of people jockeying around, thinking that they might, if she won, you know, get different positions. She had been very, very judicious about not promising anybody anything. People had made their feelings known, um, but she wouldn't promise anybody anything. And there were requests for, you know, quid pro quos. She just didn't do that. She felt it was inappropriate. I think she had a list in the back of her head that maybe she and her husband John knew, maybe her brother Dan. I don't think anybody else knew what that list was. Um, and we were still doing numbers. We were going back and forth. I think it maybe was around 11.30 at night. Uh, and Governor Florio called to concede, which no one could believe. I mean, we were astonished that that call was coming in. 
And then it was tears and hugs and kisses and um, it was kind of that Robert Redford moment about, oh my God, what do we do now kind of thing. So it was a very, very exciting evening, but it was instantly, what, what do we do tonight? What do we do tomorrow? We knew there would be a series of national TV interviews very early in the morning. How do you tee up for that? And how do, you, how do you start the transition? People don't talk about transition often, you know? If I had my way, I would, uh, and if I were 40, I, I would run a transition firm. Because I think that period of time is so critical. And I think most candidates don't think about it because they think it's untoward to talk about what will happen when I win. They'll hire a speech coach, a financial coach, a political coach. I mean, you have consultants for everything today, but often they don't have a consultant for the transition. And if they could start earlier, I think you'll see that now, maybe a little behind, below the radar. But that, that's pretty daunting that next morning when you have to just hit the ground running. It used to be you'd win and you'd go on vacation for two weeks. I mean, that was years ago. They don't do that anymore. You're expected to be on the job at the top of that escalator at New Jersey Transit, shaking hands, saying thank you. And on the other hand, now you have to start to work with the outgoing governor. And that was certainly challenging. And for Governor Whitman, her immediate transition, the day after, that was the day I believe the news broke that Ed Rollins had to say about walking around money. It wasn't right away after that. It wasn't that. right away, a couple of weeks. Oh, it was, okay. Yeah. My, that's my recollection. Okay. Do you remember that, your reaction to that when he came, when he surfaced with, with that statement? I do. Uh, I, I remember, first of all, getting the transition in place. John Sheridan and Hazel managing the transition um, and we should go back and talk a little bit about what's involved in transition in that short nine weeks. But, and I don't know exactly how far in, a week, two weeks, or something, Peter Venero called me very early in the morning, which was not unusual, and we would often have, uh, you know, I would talk with a number of people, and then I would speak to the governor early in the morning and give her an idea of what the day looked like ahead. And he said that they had just received information that Ed Rollins had, had alleged that the way Whitman won the campaign was to suppress the black vote um, with the assistance of black ministers in New Jersey. And Peter was very quick to remind me that if that was proven to be true, it would invalidate the election. So this wasn't just you know, a pain in the neck. This was critical. So I made the call to her. Uh, it was not my favorite call to make. Um, but I do remember her immediate reaction was get everybody together. I want everybody in the office who would have any knowledge of anything about this. And that's how we started the day. And we, w we went around the table. Because in a campaign, you have so many people doing so many different things. You don't always know who has done what, right? You're the candidate. You're ultimately responsible because you either knew or should have known. But there are things you don't know. Um, and I think she wanted to satisfy herself first that from the people who would who would have known, to ha hear them say it didn't happen and couldn't have happened, this is how we can prove it didn't happen, um, that, that she then started to put a team together to address this publicly. How, how do we deal with that? But she was just immediate and no recriminations, no, uh, no immediate reaction, it didn't happen. She didn't say that. She didn't start from that premise. She started from, let's find out. So you really had a chance to see how this governor operated under a lot of duress right away. Immediately. 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 And, and 
based on that and then things going forward. I always said and still say about her, she never got flattered and she never got flustered. She just was not flustered by that. She just went into gear and she had a lot of faith in her advisors, um, other than Ed Rollins who had made the comment. Um, and we, ha we really worked very, very hard um, internally and we knew as we were doing that on the outside there were a whole series of investigations that were being announced. I mean no one who uh, was on the other side or for some reason or another didn't want to see her as the governor, they could not pass this opportunity up. So there was an investigation by the legislature, the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, the Democratic Party, everybody wanted hearings. I mean there was really a lot going on and often in, in the political world you're asked to prove a negative which you know can't be done. So you, you really have to work very carefully at that. Do you recall how long it took before that was cleared? By the time all of the investigations ran their course, it was a number of weeks. We clearly wanted it cleaned up before she was going to be sworn in. So we encouraged whoever was going to hold these investigations to uh, proceed with it and proceed quickly. She would make herself available. Her advisors would make themselves available, um, but we wanted it behind us. So when um, you may recall, or in, in part of your due diligence, you may have heard the story of Jesse Jackson and, and Al Sharpton coming to town to talk to her. And it may have been that same morning or the very next morning. And she got the call. They uh, were together in Newark. And they were going to organize a huge march against her. She got on the phone with them. She asked me to, to reach out. You know, you, you never know. You're living in this one world, and the next day you're trying to figure out how to get in touch with Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. But um, we invited them to Trenton to meet with the governor directly before they did anything else. Would they afford her that opportunity? And she and two or three other people, I was not in the room, behind closed doors, hammered this thing out. And whatever all of those discussions were, they came out supporting her, which was just incredible. Here is this very waspy looking uh, Republican um, would be governor and the two, two very visible leaders in, in the black community standing next to her as saying, we believe what the governor says, we believe that she's going to make an honest effort to get to the bottom of this, uh, we urge people to participate, come forward with anything they know. And it was really, it was really a catch-22 because if it were proven to be true, it would have meant that the black ministers agreed to this. Yes. Which clearly they had denied. So, I mean, it was a really interesting kind of case study of what was involved. And as you know, at the end of the day, it all came out of a self-admitted braggadocio by Ed Rollins, who he's back in Washington now, and his colleagues are saying, wow, how did you pull that one out of the bag? Um, an, an incumbent had never been defeated in New Jersey up to that point. You know, everyone would have expected that Jim Florio would have had a second term. Um, so he's very puffed up at the press club, and he implied that this voter suppression had taken place. And he later admitted that that wasn't true, that he did that. Of course, he let us hang out there until it was proven in these different venues, but uh, that, that was the course of that. That was, that was a real trial, not just for the governor, but for people around her and making judgments about who would be in the cabinet and who would advise her. That was a pretty good proving ground. Quite a tempest, yeah. Yes. Um, so what exactly was your role in the transition 
And who did you work with? Well, the transition is many things in, in nine weeks. Uh, we had to first put a, um, we had to put the transition staff in place, find an office and, and, and staff it. And we decided, which is probably not a good um, recommendation to an incoming governor, because the skill set to campaign is so different from the skill set to govern. But we said to everybody who had been in the campaign, every one of you will have a role in transition and will have an opportunity to work in the administration. You may not all work in the governor's office, but um, they knew her, they were loyal to her, um, and, it, and it's hard to, to break it right there. So we had that whole core come in and help us start with transition. But the biggest job was to find a cabinet, to identify a cabinet, uh, and, and high-level positions that you were entitled to fill as the uh, fruits of, of victory. Um, we had to plan an inaugural, which is more than just a party. It really is a prescribed ceremony with a lot of history. That's why it's run by the, um, uh, by the military side. Um, we had, and we had to raise money to, to do that. We, we had a very small budget for transition. We had to plan the first budget, and we had to plan the first state of the state, and you had to do that in nine weeks with the Ed Rollins dust up um, around it. So that was my job to, to manage that. Um, and I think we were very successful. We had all but one cabinet officer selected. Uh, at the governor's direction, we had the most diverse cabinet. Um, the very first day, she announced me as the chief of staff, Lana Hooks as secretary of state, and um, uh, Debbie Poritz as the attorney general. And the secretary of state and the attorney general's office are the two constitutional officers. So there was a panic among the uh, Jerseyites, that this was going to be an all-female cabinet. I mean, that's what they saw first, right? All three. And then it spun out from there. But it was very interesting that she put that right out there the first day and, and named Hazel and John as the, the transition chairs. Did the uh, Florio administration help out in, through this process? Um, they did, but I think it was very difficult. I mean, if you can imagine being in their shoes, they did not expect to lose. So I don't think they had any real plan B in place of what to do for transition. I don't know if they had a transition director or if they had thought about winding down major public policies or letting certain contracts work you would want to get done before you turned it over to the next person. So uh, that afternoon, the first day, John Sheridan and I walked into that governor's office. I think that's the hardest thing I had to do in the whole campaign. And, and we all know each other. I mean, we're all, you know, I'm a golfer, so we would say we're all inside the ropes, right? And we have a lot of respect for each other. We've worked together. We've opposed each other. Uh, and you're walking in and just... Just no one thought they would lose or could lose. But I remember Rick Wright was the governor's chief of staff at the time. He got it. He got the king is dead, long live the king. That's how it works. And he kind of grabbed hold of it, um, got the right people together, gave us access to things that we felt we needed access to. Um, when you run, you think you have a pretty good view of what the governorship is like. But you're not privy to a lot of the lawsuits. You're not privy to the, the numbers behind the numbers in a budget. You're not privy to some of the personnel matters uh, that, are, that are festering. Or um, It's a very, very difficult time. But slowly but surely, everybody got on board and uh, made available to us what we needed to do to make the transition. And they had requests as well. Is there any chance that you could 
keep so-and-so on for another six months. They're about to vest and retire. They've done a great job. They're not a rabid partisan. Um, so there was some of that trading back and forth. The governor said, I'll finish up a couple of things, kind of hot potatoes, so they don't have to be handed to you. The governor-elect was asking for some things. Generally, the governor-elect comes in and says, I don't want you to let any more contracts. I want you to stay all personnel decisions. You know, they, they want certain things to stop. And the governor, as was his prerogative, said no to a number of them. No, I'm governor and for another nine weeks, and I intend to govern during that period of time. So there's that kind of back and forth. So much more, as you said, than people <laughs> would ever expect. Would you ever just expect. You don't really see it. And your hope in the inside is that they don't see it because we have this great luxury in this country to turn over power without bloodshed and without uh, real recrimination. And, uh, and it's a smaller level, believe me, at a governorship than, say, the U.S. presidency. But we're supposed to be able to turn over power in a statesperson-like way. So you're working to do that on the outside. But inside, you know, you're really dealing with people's lives, people who are coming into a new opportunity, people who are leaving earlier than they thought they would or thought they should, you know. That's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. When were you asked to be chief of staff? And what was that like for you? Um, this is so funny because no one knew who she would ask to do anything. We were guessing. Everybody would guess as we got closer. And when it looked like she had a possibility to win, or even if we thought she wasn't going to win, it was like a good thing to do over drinks. Well, what do you think? Who would be here and who would be there? And so we had no idea at all. I mean, one of the strong rumors was that she might make her brother chief of staff. So, I, I mean, I really didn't know. And I wasn't an A player, and I wasn't there all the time. She called me the Sunday before the election, before uh, Tuesday, and ask if I wanted to do it. And I, I was really conflicted about it because, you know, I had worked so hard in the firm to try to hold it together. Hazel had been out there doing all the hard work to, to pick up and, and leave her as she was coming back, I knew would be very difficult. But I knew I had finished my master's in public policy. How could you not think about being chief of staff and to be the first female chief of staff to the first female governor. Right. So I, I said, I, I'd really like to do it, but could I talk to you on the bus tomorrow? I mean, I am a lobbyist. I, I just need to talk through a couple of things of, of what that would mean. So I got on the bus the next day, and that's the day before the election. And it's raining, and we went and sat in the back of the bus, and I said, I got the strangest call last night, a woman who sounds just like you. <laughs> called and said, would you like to be chief of staff? And I said, I don't know. If it was you, was it because I got free donuts the day before when we were on the bus? I mean, what is this all about? What do you expect? What do you think I can bring to the team? Um, what's the team going to look like? Um, how are you going to deal with the lobbying side of things? Um, if we really decide to do this, I can tell you that I will totally divest myself from the firm. No blind trusts, no anything. I will be bought out of the firm. I, I will go. So that's how we talked through it. And she said, I think I'd like to ask Peter to be the chief counsel and Jane the chief. Said, totally your prerogative, prerogative, let's do it. And so I think they knew, but I think they were the only, we were the only three who knew. Do you remember what she said about why you, why she chose you? I don't. I don't. I, I, and I, maybe to this day I'll, I'll wonder about that. I, I don't know what it was. I, we were somewhat alike in temperament, uh, and I think that may have had something to do with it. Um, 
I don't, I don't really know. That's a good question for her, and I'd, I'd like to see it in her interview. What did it feel like to be the first woman chief of staff to the first female governor of New Jersey? And was that apparent to you? I mean, did, uh, was there a big deal made about that in the state at that time? Um, you know, Marie, you are so overwhelmed by the job. Do you have very little time to, to sit back and pat yourself on the back or whatever you might do uh, to acknowledge that? I, I, I knew that that was so. She said in her acceptance speech that she understood what it was like to be the first female governor. She didn't duck from that at all. She was right out front about it. Um, I guess I remember it most when it came time to some small everyday decisions, things that we did to try to level the playing field, not just for women, but others who were underrepresented in government. And that was a particular goal of the, the governor and had always been a hope of mine that we would have a governor who would come in and work for a diverse cabinet, diverse appointments, diverse opinions. Um, so, I mean, you are aware of it. I, I remember there was a um, Na National Republican Governors Association meeting shortly after she was elected, and it was in, um, I think it was in Phoenix, Arizona. And she was the only female governor at the time out of the 50. So to be out there, and to see the kind of attention that she got. And there was, there was some other kind of rookies out there, although she and Virginia are the only two that run in that off year. Um, one day she was being interviewed for something. And, and as I said, this is like contrary to that rich person from the hills. She had some very, very basic suit on. And I said, Christy, you, you got you to gotta dress this up a little bit. You got to do a little something. So somebody in the crowd, uh, I, I think maybe her sister who was out there, had a scarf. I said, can I borrow your scarf? We'll put this on. So she had a great interview. The other guys, unfortunately, were hardly spoken to. They were, all the questions were for the, the new gal. And afterwards, she said, wow, did, can you believe that attention? I said, it was all the scarf. It was just, <laughs> don't let that go to your head. It was just all the scarf. But... Um, you know, I, I think we just each and, and other people um, in the cabinet just knew that every chance we had to make a difference in that area, because um, we had always talked about what it would look like with a female governor, we took the chance to do it. It was mainly appointments, but it was decisions and policies, and we kind of understood that it was our chance to do that because we didn't know if another chance would come along. Did you feel, along those lines, did you feel a certain amount of extra pressure on you to just do a good job because here you were, the first female chief of staff? Sure, sure. I, I knew that there was a different standard. And I, I also knew that there would be people gunning for me uh, and gunning for the governor who didn't wish us well and thought it would be easier to undermine us as females. I mean, the guys do this too. They're, they're constantly at each other. They're, they'll do whatever it takes to be the top dog, um, and they're used to that. Women aren't as used to it. They're not as used to that challenge, um, and they don't really expect it. They think they, they don't deserve it, maybe, in some ways. The guys know it's coming. Maybe it's all those years of playing uh, sports, you know, a little league and high school football and college or something. They're used to that. They bang the devil out of each other, and then they shake hands and go out and have a drink. Um, so people, I, I think, really did try to come after us, thinking that they could undermine us. And often with women, it, it's around some of the kind of the more social sides, you know. Is she not being a good mother and a good wife and a... Uh, not that it was a bad policy. You know, the guys often go after the guys on the competency side, I find. 
How did you feel about that, that kind of scrutiny? I mean, as the governor would say, what choice do I have? I'm a female governor because I'm a female. I mean, I, I, neither one of us had a choice about that. So we either served the best that we could, being aware of that, and on the other side, having the opportunity to make some changes. Um, what a rare opportunity that is. And it was done at a very small level. I, I'll tell you a story that I think captures that very, very early on in the administration. I got a call from a newspaper, a very large newspaper, out of state. And it was the top dog, the editor, saying that he had a uh, reporter who had been sexually harassed by someone very high in the Whitman administration. I think in many cases, at least we had thought, the, a, a guy getting that call might have said, well, let me look into it, and I don't know, and wh what do you want to do about it, and, you know, did something really, really serious happen, or is she going to file a suit, or what's going to happen? I immediately said, I want you to come into the office, and if you will bring your reporter as well, that will be fine. We can get you in here very quietly. I'll have the right people at the table. He came in, and he came in with the reporter, and we had um, the attorney general, a woman. We had the head of personnel who knew all those rules, a woman, and the governor came into the meeting, a woman. So there he is with the four women. We laid out a plan of action as to how we would approach this. Uh, we did what we needed to do on our side. Uh, they were pleased with the response. Uh, no suit was ever filed. Uh, and we went on about our business. But, but I think that was the sensitivity of women. It was quite amazing. Quite amazing. Yes. Tell me about a little bit more about your role as Chief of Staff and, and what a typical day for you was like. That obviously was not a typical uh, day. Tell us about there a typical day. There is no day. typical day, oh. Marie. There just is no <laughs> typical day. Um, let me say two things. There, there's really two parts to that job, or at least as I saw it, or chose to embrace it. The first is a pretty plebeian management job. You have to run the governor's office. Hundreds of people, millions of dollars in a budget. You're running the office of administration, communications, uh, gubernatorial appointments, scheduling, um, advance, uh, the governor's Washington office. Uh, they all have directors, they all have staff, they all have budgets, they all have responsibilities. I would have a meeting every week with everybody. Um, so that's a responsibility in and of itself. And the governor, God bless her, during the campaign, and I think Carrie Edwards had pushed her into this, had agreed to cut back the uh, budget and the number of people working in the governor's office by, pick a number, I don't know what it was, 25%, 30%. Well, that might have been fine had another governor continued. Now you have Christy Whitman. Everyone in the world wants access to her. She's the first female. She's a Republican. She beat an incumbent. They all wanted a piece of her. So all of those functions of communications and advance and, and the scheduling were just on overload, and we had to cut the, the staff back. And we did it every week. I would say to Joyce Simmelman, who headed up administration, what's our budget? How many people are working for us? Because we knew we had to hit that, uh, that benchmark. So there's that administrative side, which if not done correctly, has a terrible political impact. You know, if, if you make a mistake in those areas, it's, it's real egg on the face. So that's the one side. The other side is the policy and the political advisor role. Um, I sat, sat in on every meeting with her. I went every place with her, which was a tough decision. Should the chief of staff stay in the office? 
when she's out or go with her. But I really knew so little about her that I thought I really needed to be with her and to see what she was like with different groups and how she handled things. And when she would say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, you always see staff like right, writing it down because now you know, you're held to that. And she was, I, I think of all of her tenants, and in doing a little preparation for today's interview, I read back through some of her state of the state and budget and inaugural speeches. If you do that, you'll see on almost every page where she talks about keeping her promises. She was hell-bent on that, to her credit. Um, so doing the, the policy and, and the political side, um, it's really the stuff that gives you nightmares because I, I knew what her agenda was over here. And it was pretty simple. Create more jobs, cut taxes, and keep my promises. That was probably it. Three prong, keep that in front of us. So I knew that I had to work about 50% of every day on those subject matters because it's too easy to get distracted. And then the other half, you have all this stuff coming over the transom, things that are happening federally, in legislation, in litigation, uh, natural disasters, the pipeline blows up in oh, Edison. Gosh, that's right. I, I, there are just so many things. And I think what gives most chiefs of staff heartburn is that you don't know if you've given off the right stuff, kind of dismissed it, send it to somebody else to work on, or that you've taken on really trivial, trivial stuff that takes up too much of your time from the important stuff. So making that, de that decision, I'll keep this, I'll hand it off, I'll keep this, I'll hand it off, is very, very hard. And you I, develop a sense of that, I suppose, at, uh, or an instinct about it as you continue in the administration, right? Start well, to... and the feedback from the governor and others when it would turn out that, boy, am I glad that I didn't hand that off because it turned out to be bigger than a bread box. Um, you know, it was validated that way. There had been a chief of staff who served before me, sometime before me. And the rep on him was that, and it, it is totally overwhelming. I, I don't care who you are as a manager. This is totally overwhelming. Um, they said that everything he couldn't handle, he put in the bottom drawer of the desk. And when he left, all these issues that nobody knew what had happened to them, they opened the bottom drawer of the desk, and there they all were. So I had that, someone had told me that story, and I had that fear. And I was determined that that would be an empty drawer. I was not going to have anything in there. And I had put enough good people around me who I trusted that I could hand things to and said, you, you have to take care of this, or I did it. I just, I, I just had that awful, awful thought. Yeah, we know usually chiefs of staff, of governors, don't stay all that long. They stay maybe a couple of years. That it's, there's a real burnout factor to that. That's something you can really understand. I served for about uh, 16 months, wow. and that's the longest any first chief of staff in New Jersey had served, and I think that's true until uh, Rich Bagger, until just recently with Rich. I think somebody could fact check that, but up until my 16 months, no one had done 16 months. And uh, I used to look across the river in New York. The chiefs of staff would stay for eight years. I was like, Brad, how do you do that? But there, there's something, uh, especially when you're turning over government, because every one of the Democrats that you're dealing with felt that they shouldn't have been pushed out. And every one of the Republicans, especially in a close race, they feel they were the one person who pushed her over the top and they deserve X, right. Y, and Z. So you don't make any of the Democrats happy because you tell them they have to go or step back. And you're making maybe one out of ten Republicans happy. 
because you only have so much discretion. There's this feeling that you can turn over all of government. Well, you can't. I mean, there's laws in place, and uh, there are only so many jobs that you can do, and, and everybody thinks they deserve something. So it's a very, very hard spot to be in. Plus, there are the internal squabbles that everybody wants your job. When you're the first among equals, people aren't content to not be that person. So they, they'd like to get in that seat, too. Yeah, pressure cooker. There. It's a pressure cooker. Yes. When we were speaking a little bit earlier, you, you talked about how um, there was this sense that this was your chance to really put people underrepresented folks into positions of power and, and within the administration. Can you talk a little bit more about what you recall about the selection process for cabinet members and, and your role in that? If mm -hmm. you have one. This was in a day and age when so much of this was still done manually. We still didn't have the advantage of some great computer system to feed it into. So we were receiving resumes and recommendations from everybody, near and far. And actually Joyce Himmelman, uh, who became the Director of Administration, kind of managed that. How she did it, I'll have no idea. But she would start to develop a list of candidates. And then John um, Sheridan and Hazel Gluck would meet and they would start to go through them and vet them down and they would do some preliminary interviews. Um, I would sit in on some, but not all of those. And the advantage with that, um, and again, the governor took some criticism because here you, know, you have a lobbyist doing this kind of work. But they had each been cabinet officers. They knew how government worked. Um, so they would develop a number of names, and then the governor would generally interview three. And I often sat in on those interviews. And um, they did a great job for us, really. Um, there was only one case where, you know, it's very, very hard, it seems, to pick a treasurer, because a treasurer plays a very central role in dealing with the legislature. The budget is obviously your policy document. Um, so we interviewed, um, we were interviewing Brian Clymer for transportation. People had said, he'd be great. And we brought him in and we're about halfway through the interview. And we're saying to each other before we could text each other, right? There was no That's Blackberry right. or Droid at the time, but you could, the body language was, what are we doing? This guy should be the treasurer. He's really great. So we switched gears and we started talking to him about being the treasurer. And we said, now, who, do you have any great recommendation to be the transportation commissioner? He actually knew um, Wilson. And he said, I, th I think, Frank Wilson, he said, I think you should interview Frank. And, and, and they were a very funny team. They were like frick and frack together. But that, that's how that happened. So, um, I may have mentioned this before, we got to the end of transition and we had appointed all but one cabinet officer. We didn't have an insurance, surprise, surprise, commissioner. You know, you have to have a death wish to take that job anyway. So, um, but we had, it, we had it all done and some of the major uh, appointments as well. We had, uh, for instance, there had never been a woman who was the head of the Port Authority. Some of the boards and commissions were pretty powerful. So we asked Kathy Donovan if she would chair that board, uh, the New York and New Jersey Port Authority. We asked Nancy Becker to be the deputy at the Turnpike. I mean, women hadn't served in these positions before. We had the first Hispanic cabinet officer. Um, and it was really, really exciting to do that. Uh, and you really felt like you were making a difference. I can imagine. What was the, in, in terms, and I know you've, you've mentioned along the way with this interview, but when the cabinet was selected and everybody was in place, what was the reaction to the fact that there were just so many women as part of it? Um, I think in some ways people were not surprised 
she had said she would work for diversity. You may remember one of her great slogans was One Family, Many Faces, which I think is marvelous to this day, along with New Jersey and you perfect together. Um, I, I think there were some people who were worried about it, who had not worked with women before, didn't quite know how to approach that many women in powerful positions. And, and we do work differently. I'm not saying better or worse than, than men, but it is different. Uh, different priorities, different approaches, different protocols. Um, so we all had to learn. Uh, and, and many people coming before us had to learn. I mean, the governor loved to hear the opposite position. So in the beginning, she did a number of roundtables with different interest groups, for-profit, not-for-profit, regional, by subject matter. And she always wanted both sides of the, um, of the central question represented. And I remember we did something on school takeover and on education. And she had a lot of Democrats come out of the Democratic cities and the Republicans were just, they were really miffed. They, you know, they thought this was their opportunity. Wow, they've been, you know, they were out for four years with a Democratic governor. They finally get a Republican governor and she invites all these Democrats in. And she said, I want to hear both sides and I, I want it to happen in front of one another. I don't want to get ping-ponged. You come in and say A, you come in and say B. Now I have to go back and check B and C and uh, she would have them at the, at the same table. So I think that was a little different. And she didn't engage with the legislature the way they would have liked. Now, in all fairness, the legislature would like 110% of any governor's time. They're, they're co-equal branches of government. We get that. Um, but they would like to have 110% of the time. But they, they don't want her... 10% of the time. So there, there was a knock on not interfacing enough with them. And a part of that was not having been a part of the good old boys club, if, if you will. Um, and she didn't win with the outright support of the structural party. She won with a lot of independents and others. So she wasn't really as beholden to the party and the structure as maybe former governors had been. So she didn't feel the need to interface that often. But, but it was different, um, and I think good for the, you know, the progress of the, of the sexes and of uh, how to govern with a, a, a very diverse group of people. That, that idea of um, not needing to interface <laughs> perhaps got a real started out with a bang in a way if I recall correctly in her inaugural speech she surprised everybody by by saying she was going to begin with the tax cuts sooner than anyone expected I'm, I'm sorry not giving you the as specific as, no, I, I as know what but, you're but you're to. you know what I'm referring to I I was watching the inaugural speech and sort of looking at the reaction, and it was very interesting. Right. Well, did you, you knew that was coming, no doubt, and did she anticipate that there would be um, a little bit of a backlash to that announcement? We did. Um, Bill Clinton had come into office a year beforehand, and he had raised taxes retroactively. I forget what the tax was, but and however he did it, when he came into office in January 17th or something, uh, there was some tax that he put in place that went back beyond his term. One of the three tenants that Christie had was to cut taxes. Mm -hmm. She firmly, firmly believed in that. All of her advisors, they gave her a, a, a whole... Um, spectrum of options and she just always believed in that part she was convinced that would work to turn the economy around so um, in drafting the speech we were thinking how can how can we make this real 
And I don't know whose idea it was. I, I wish it had been mine. It wasn't mine. Um, said, why don't you sign an executive order right as part of the inaugural? And it, it created the, this um, Economic Study Commission or something. I, that's not the right name at all. I'm sorry. I don't have that on the tip of my tongue. But, and she also said, and, and by executive order, th there was this one tax that she could cut back, and she said, and unlike the president, I will cut your taxes retroactively. And we knew that would get a big bang, but it did leave the legislature out. She had no time, and she didn't want to consult with them. I mean, everybody's very close to the vest. They want to reserve to themselves the right to make certain announcements. And in any government setting, information is power. So if you let anybody in on something, they've had that conversation with 10 others by the time you ever get to announce it. So we kept that very, very close. And that, that did send a good signal. Um, one thing we, we had forgotten is that you're not really the governor until you sign this paperwork, which you do after the fact. So in some ways, she wasn't the governor when she did that. Uh, she had taken the oath. She had been given the seal. Um, but she had to sign the papers in the back room, so she re-signed the executive order uh, to make sure that was legit. Wow. But I, I thought it was great. I thought it really sent a message about how she was going to govern. I, I think her lead-in was, why wait? We'll do it today. We'll do it now. And Peter Venero came up and had the executive order right out there, and she signed it, and he sat down, and she went on with the speech. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Your passion is policy. Uh, I love what, the policy side. What would you say were your most significant accomplishments? Um, in, the, in the policy arena with the governor? Yes. We talked a lot about um, how to create jobs and how to create jobs without raising taxes. Um, we talked about how to have tax cuts. I think at the end of her tenure, she had something like 37 different tax cuts. She had vowed to reduce the income tax 30%. We worked very, very hard to get that done, and, and we did. I think she created about half a million new jobs. Um, we worked a lot on renewing the Transportation Trust Fund, and I had had the experience to do that uh, at DOT when, when we raised the tax. This time we didn't do it by raising the tax. There was no stomach for that, uh, no profiles encouraged to, to do that, and we found a way to do that. Um, we worked at making government smaller uh, and tried not to use that term because we wanted to make it smarter. Uh, we wanted to resize government. Um, she did end up getting rid of the Department of Higher Education and I think the Office of the Public Advocate, which cut back a, a number of positions and budgets that went with that. And it, and it did allow us to say, I think at the end of the day, maybe we cut back out of about 60,000 state workers, cut back 5,000, whatever that percentage is. Um, it's very, very hard to, to cut back. You see every governor struggle with that. Um, I think I, I would say my greatest accomplishment didn't result in any one piece of legislation, but we worked so hard to employ the tenant of prevention and early intervention. Rather than spending money at the back end of a problem, whether it was in education or in health or in corrections, if you could get to somebody early uh, before they were totally drug addicted or before they needed major hospitalizations or before they had dropped out of school, if you could put that money up front um, in prevention and early intervention, we could really make a difference not only in the budget, which is huge, but in people's lives. And we struggled with that with every issue that came before us. How can we back up to the beginning of the spectrum 
and not always react to the end um, and have to put the money into it and see the human suffering. It just, it didn't make sense. We shifted that paradigm as much as we could, but it's hard. It's very, very hard. Because if you're treating, let's say that you're spending money now for someone in the hospital who has a terminal disease, you can't just say, as of tomorrow, we're not funding that anymore because we're going to start this preventative program. So you have, to, you have to continue what you have, but where you have the chance to get a little extra money on this end, you have to quickly get it back here or it gets eaten up out here. Um, and that's true today. I mean, if we could do prevention and early intervention, we would do much better. How would you assess the Whitman administration as a whole, with the benefit of hindsight now? That 2020 hindsight? Yes. Um, I think she did everything that we would ask any governor to do, and she would be measured as a success by any scale that we use. I know there are uh, opponents who say she did a couple of things wrong and it made for a bad governorship. And, and we could tick through some of those. But what she did right was keep her promises. She reduced the income tax 30%. She created almost a half a million, something like 435,000 new jobs in her tenure, keeping in mind her tenure was seven years, not eight. Who knows what she could have done with, with one more year. She uh, cut the structural deficit by 75%. She took the one shots out of uh, budgets, which she had promised to do in the beginning. Very hard to do, because you have to have a balanced budget. Um, she uh, put in place uh, a program to dedicate more open space than any governor up to that point, a million uh, acres of uh, open space. She increased the rainy day fund 800%. The, the rainy day fund was almost non-existent when we took over. And again, I think because the Florio administration thought they had eight years and not four. You know, he may have made it healthier at the end of the eighth year, but we were catching it at the fourth, so it had to be rebuilt. Um, she had downsized uh, the size of government. A and all of those metrics, you would say that was a damn good governor, I think. Um, and I know she made a difference in lots of people's lives. I, I think she brought a dignity and a uh, stature uh, to the front office. Um, we used to say when she rebuilt the dome, and you'll remember her husband John raised money from school kids and others to help uh, rebuild the dome because the whole state house needed to be, the front needed to be redone. And the architect said, until you do the dome, you can't do anything because it's going to fall yeah. down. So we like to say that she, when she rebuilt the dome, she, um, she took the tarnish off the outside and the inside. And I think she did that. Um, really no scandals. She had difficult issues around racial profiling um, that I think she had to undertake. She really, she had no choice in that but to hit that head on. Uh, and I know there was resentment of, of that. Um, and a couple of other issues, there's always a criticism about how governors deal with the pension monies. And um, so when I hear people say negative things about her, uh, they're often along those two lines. Everything else is a positive metric. I mean, I, I, think, she, I think she had a great service. Uh, without personal scandal, n nobody in her administration was indicted. I said at the end of my term I had never been named Geek of the Week. If you'll remember in the Trentonian newspaper every week they had some Geek of the Week that had done something outrageously ridiculous. And, so, I, you know, I, I think she had a really, really good run at it. When you hear the criticism about pension fund and the racial profiling, 
what do you make of, of those and can you address those too? Well, I, I, I never like to hear them because I think they're always one-sided, but I realize I had the privilege to be on the inside and know the other side of the story. Um, and most people don't. When you hear people say ridiculous things about government, they, they often have not had the experience to be on the inside and to understand that at best government is a balancing of interest. It's not serving any one interest. So, so they, don't, they don't know the other side. Um, she left with a billion dollar um, um, surplus. Now, unfortunately, that wasn't there at the end of what would have been her eighth year. So a lot of people say, you know, she spent down the treasury. She did not. She had a billion dollar budget when she, uh, um, what do I want to say, surplus, surplus when, she, when she left. Um, the racial profiling piece and, and the frisking of the, the, um, the suspect in Camden, it's very funny when that happened. A lot of people advised her not to do that. But she really wanted to go and see what it was like. This wasn't some voyeurism or... She heard often from the troopers and from the attorney general and those people on the law enforcement side how difficult their jobs were. And they were always asking for more money and more equipment and more classes. And she just wanted to know. She was a very hands-on, let, let me see it kind of person. And she made the fateful decision to go out with them a couple of times. And they were, frankly, from what I've been told, thrilled about that, that the governor would take that level of interest. And when somebody said, would you want to do this frisk? I, I, why she did, I, I don't know. She probably is asking herself that, but she did. Someone took a picture, and as I understand it, uh, that picture was taken because they were so proud that she was out there and involved. It didn't surface for a very, very long time. When the issue of racial profiling came up and people were angry at her for taking on the state police, that picture surfaced, and it didn't surface willingly. That guy had really taken it to show his family. He just... He thought that was terrific, but somebody knew it existed and knew it could cause damage, and it did. Um, but those are those things that, you know, with 2020 hindsight, you say, why would I do it? But I, I've always been a person to measure intent, and I think her intent was really good on that. But I mean, clearly it had a bad result, clearly, and, and a lot of the criticism was deserved. And just briefly, as the situation with this state pension has worsened and, you know, become, became such an issue yes. in, in the last few years, her administration is, has been roundly criticized for her actions. What do you think about that? Do you think that's another, in retrospect, policy? What, what, what's your thought? Um, my thought is that she was so visible in all that she did. She took ownership of all that she did. She didn't try to push it off on a cabinet officer or the legislature. She owned that decision, which at the time she thought was the right decision. It happens to be a decision that's been made by almost every governor before and after and in other states. There's only so much money that's available. And if you look at some of the trust funds and pensions, they have enough money in them today to pay out for the next X number of years. And so it's very tempting to take some money that would have gone into even further out of years to balance the budget now, and you think, I'm always going to be able to make it up. Well, you're not always able to make it up or you're rolling the dice that the market's going to be such, the economy's going to be such, that that uh, rising tide is going to lift all the boats. And if it doesn't, now 
some number of years out, you're short funded. Anyone who was working in state government at the time wasn't going to lose a dime. Even if they lived to be 110, there was enough money there for everybody in the system and for those coming into the system. But there wasn't the money for all time going forward for everybody who was back here. So uh, in essence, I say she, she did what many have done. Um, it just was one thing they could accurately pin on her. You, as we discussed before, you stuck it out for 16 months, as you said, one of the longest. How did it feel, though, when you made the decision to go? And what, was it tough to walk away? It was, um, this side of my body was very tough to walk away. I cried all the way home in the car um, because it was so emotional. The other side was so pleased that I had done what I came to do. I had met every commitment to her. We had a very good first year and a half. Most governors don't. Most governors have a very tough first year and a half. And then they get their feet under them and they, they start to do better. Or the revenues come in from the decisions that they've made. They're spending it on good programs. So I felt really, really good about what I had done. I was very burned out. I have never been that um, empty in my life. I, I used to listen to NPR before I took the job. And I love these esoteric discussions about building bike seats and the economy in China and whatever they talked about for a half an hour at a time. The whole time I served as her chief of staff, I would get in that car and I would put country music on. I wanted mindless, mindless. Um, it, it's that hard. Yeah. It really is that hard. And if you would, just your career since then, tell us a little bit about that. I went back into the firm, uh, which we then named Gluck Shaw, uh, and we merged with another firm, at, and MBI Gluck Shaw still functions in, in Trenton. I had two gubernatorial appointments. I served on the Merit System Board, uh, which was very, very interesting because that's the board that hears civil service um, uh, appeals. and. Uh, the governor had really won, and this is very au courant, had wanted to make performance a part of the decision when they were doing layoffs and bumping. And she finally got it done, albeit we went to hearings in a bus with state police uh, protection. I mean, the hearings were so brutal around this subject, but she did get it done. Unfortunately, it got unturned after she left. But uh, so I served on the, on the Merit System Board. I served on a, um, I think it was a New Jersey Heritage Commission or, or something appointed by, um, by John Bennett when he was acting governor okay. during part of that period of time. Um, I had a very, very serious back surgery and decided to retire at that point. Um, opened a small consulting firm, Hourglass Consulting. I've done little projects here and there. Um, volunteering, I volunteer for the First Tee, a great golf program for at-risk kids. Uh, when I'm in Florida and when I'm in Massachusetts, I work in the emergency room of a hospital. I love that, I mean, it's just great. Um, I play golf when I can, and uh, that's life as I know it now. It's, it's pretty good. Excellent, thanks Judy. Welcome.